Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be talking about a subject that probably a lot of us really don't know if we want to know more about, but are very, very intrigued with, and that is terrorism. On the program today, we're going to be talking with author Peter L. Hello. And I'd like to welcome our special guest, Mr. Ken Ballin, who is author of Terrorists in Love, The Real Lives of Islamic Radicals. Ken, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Uh, thank you for having me, Daniel. You bet. Now, this is an interesting book in and of itself. I mean, you look at the title itself, Terrorists in Love. Tell us about that title. Yes, the book is really the story, the inside, intimate stories of six individuals and what led them to radicalism and almost more importantly, what led them away for many of them. One of the stories in the book is of a jihadi, Romeo and Juliet. A young man in Saudi Arabia falls in love with a young woman. What would be common for our arts here in the United States? For five years, he courts this woman, and they're madly in love with each other. But this is Saudi Arabia, not the United States, and he does not have the $50,000, I'm sorry, the $30,000 dowry to marry her, a payment that's required by her father and which is customary in that culture. So he can't marry her. She, she is married off against her will to a man who has $35,000, in fact, <laughs> and a man who's three times her age. He's well over 60. She, she becomes his fourth wife. She feels she doesn't, doesn't give consent to this whole arrangement. She feels as if she's been raped, um, in fact. And the, and the young man, he goes off to fight in Iraq against Americans because he believes that if he dies and goes to heaven in a holy war for God, that he can marry in heaven whomever he wants, and so that he can marry his love in heaven. And she escapes from the man and uh, tries to do the same thing, so she can marry in heaven. That's, well, that's one story, so then you can see the theme of terrorists in love. There was a, there's another young man who goes off to fight. Um, he has never met a woman before outside of his own mother and, and relatives. He goes to Iraq. He gets blown up in a suicide attack. Miraculously, he survives. His, his, his body is covered with wounds. His, his hands are burned off. His limbs are burned off. He goes to Abu Ghraib, of all places, the infamous Ooh. prison hospital. He's so scared, Daniel, when he's going there that he's going to be tortured. And this was part of the reason he went in the first place, because of those famous images. But instead, what happens to him at Abu Ghraib is he's treated with kindness and respect by the Americans. He's given over 30 operations to bring him back to health. And most of all, he meets a young woman, an army medic, first woman he has ever met outside his own family. She nurses him back to health. He becomes fiercely pro-American as a result. He's changed. He's transformed. Again, he didn't have love before. He found love, and he went away from radicalism. So you see this theme throughout the book of terrorists and love. You know, I have to say, you know, when you go back to the attacks of September 11th, that was really interesting um, within the same day that it happened. You know, all of us were pretty much numbed by what had happened. It was, you know, just unbelievable. But one of the first thoughts that I had was, I, you know, I was kind of confused because I thought to myself, okay, these people grew to be young men. Somehow in their lives they had to know love to nurture them to be able to grow to that level. To go and do something like this you kind of wonder, where did they get to the point of focus and passion to do it in the first place? That somehow in their hearts, they must have had to know that this here wasn't something that was truly the right thing to do. You kind of wonder, what clicks the mindset in the heart of somebody to be able to go through with something like a terrorist attack? Well, you know, for them it is the right thing to do, and that's the paradox of it. They believe that they are, are, are fulfilling... Um, uh, God's will. They believe mm -hmm. that they're doing, being good Muslims by doing this. Uh, they don't believe they're doing the wrong thing generally. Some right. have that feeling. You know, I, I, I can give you another uh, story of the book, which is 
which, which really shows how someone can be transformed. Um, there is this young man in Pakistan. He grows up in great wealth and privilege. He is goes to a secular school. His father is an army colonel in the Pakistani army guarding that country's nuclear weapons. And they have nuclear weapons there, and that's what we should be concerned about. But he's guarding the nuclear weapon. His son goes to a, a, a secular school. He is raped by the headmaster when he is 11 years old. He, too, seeks to fall in love with a young woman from afar, as it was done in that culture. Several years later, he's humiliated as a result of that experience. He turns to religion for solace. He becomes more and more immersed in, in Islam and wanting to be a good Muslim and becoming more and more extreme in his beliefs. He eventually becomes part of the uh, cell of the Taliban that end up bombing the Marriott Hotel there. Um, and as he's coming, before he comes to meet with me, the other people in his group Google me on the Internet. You know, this is the modern age, right, where we can find out <laughs> anything about anyone. They Google me on the Internet. They find that not only I'm, a, I'm an American, but I'm a Jew, too. Mm -hmm. So they're talking about maybe we can do uh, another Daniel Pearl with this guy. You know, if you remember, Daniel Pearl was a Wall Street Journal reporter, uh, an American, and a right. American who was killed by these, these, these uh, guys uh, back a number of years ago. So there was even that kind of talk. So there... One of their leaders comes to meet with me. You've got to picture this guy. He's dressed in the long white robes. He's got a long black beard, turban around his head. He looks, to me, he looks like Osama bin Laden had just come to greet me. <laughs> and we, we spend the day together in a very long interview, and that night we have dinner together. And this is the, the you've got to put yourself in my shoes. I've interviewed over five years, over 100 these, of these guys. Okay. I'm, I'm entirely immersed in this world of... And, you know, I used to be a prosecutor, so I prosecuted terrorism cases and criminals. So I'm used to talking to people like this. It's my job. Right. So, but we're sitting there at dinner, and, um, and, and they're, they're all full of these dreams. They're, their lives are determined by dreams, and they believe in dreams and visions. And anyway, so I just happened to remember as we're eating the food a, a, a snippet of a dream I had had that morning, and I began to recount it to him. And I could see him becoming very tense and very quiet, and he began to ask me some very peculiar questions about the dream that I didn't know what he was talking about. Did you see the man's face in the dream? What was the color of the horse? All that kind of stuff. And I answered as best I could recall. It was vague like any kind of dream. And then all of a sudden he shouts out as loudly as he could, and everyone in the restaurant turns around and looks at this guy who's weird looking to begin with. You, Alu Akbar, praise God, you had the dream that I've been waiting my whole life to have. You saw a vision of the Prophet Muhammad. And the fact that you're a non-believer, that means that's why you didn't see his face. Because if you were a Muslim, you would have seen his face. Now, I, had I said to him that I saw the man's face in the dream, God knows what would have happened to me at that moment. <laughs> you know what I mean? It would have been a totally different experience. Anyway, An American prosecutor goes into terrorism and successfully well, blows yeah, up a I, compound in Houston, to Texas. Right now, I said I saw the guy's face in the dream. <laughs> but anyway, I, I answer to his satisfaction, you know, just why, who knows. And he, he, began, he, he began, you had the dream, and he was so blown away by the fact that an American, a Jew, could see the prophet in a dream and have this experience that he began quoting to me that night all these portions of the, before he would quote to me portions of the Quran that called for hill, killing and intolerance and kill all the infidels. And then he began quoting to me, because he knew the Quran by heart. He had a very mm -hmm. exalted status within this community because he could recite the whole book by heart. So he began to recite to me all these loving and tolerant passion, pass, passages from the book. And he left the radical movement and joined a kind of an Islamic missionary sect after that. And it was an amazing experience because I saw this guy changed before my eyes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just shows the power. These guys had met, I've, I've interviewed over 100 of them. They had never, never met an American before, never met a Jew before. It, it, you know, it was an amazing experience because that connection of brotherhood and human being, and him seeing me as a human being, me seeing him as a human being, bridged the gap. Now, I've got to tell you, Daniel, that doesn't work with everyone. 
There sure. are some over there who are committed to our destruction no matter what. I had another experience with a Taliban fighter, and he reached out and held my hand at the in- end of the interview, and I thought, here we go again. This is going to be another moment of brotherhood. We're uh, overcoming our differences. <laughs> and no, no, no. There's he, the check and a knife, by the way. Yeah, well, that's what basically <laughs> happened. He told me that the God said that the day of judgment will not come until every infidel is slayed. Mm-hmm. And he, he was going to, when he was done with the interview, he was going to make sure to go out there and slay some more of us. So mm-hmm. this doesn't, you know, doesn't work with everyone. But what, what's remarkable is how often people, when they're exposed to a kind of a different experience, you know, and your listeners, this is not a book about policy. This is not a book about, you know, facts about terrorism. No, this is about real people and what's inside of them and what motivates them to do what they do. That's right. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a book of stories. It's a book of real people and their feelings and their emotions mm-hmm. and their cultures and, and how you know, one kind of uh, misguided American who thought he knew something when he went over and talked to these people really discovered he didn't know all that much. Mm-hmm. So it's, it, it's my own personal journey, and it's their journey, and it's us seeing their world from a totally different perspective, which is their own perspective. Yeah, and you see, Ken, you can see how when I was asking the question earlier, you know, concerning 9-11, someone, you know, these people had mothers, you know, that raised them to become young men. And that's what, what I guess the basis of where at that particular day, you know, I mean, I was hearing, you know, other people, you know, let's go after these guys, you know, let's get payback, you know, and I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, to me, the first thing was, who nurtured these people through love to become young men, and how did they switch gears to do what they did? So, you know, I mean, there was a passion behind what they did, and I guess maybe I'm kind of one of those strange ones in the crowd, but that was my first thought. <laughs> you know? yeah, and, then, and then the question becomes, when you really dig in deep in their lives, you'll discover that some of them are simply venal, evil people who want to kill. Mm-hmm. And we have people in our own society who are like that. But you also discover then that, that some of them are just misguided. Right. And, or have missing, not able to have love with another human being, as I described with the Romeo and Juliet, or Ahmad, the guy who goes to blow himself up, or this other Pakistani who was beaten and raped and humiliated, and he, he, he couldn't find love with another human being. So the only force he could find love with was God and, and trying to be more and more radical to be more and more pure. So some of these guys are just simply mis, you know, misguided I mean, mm-hmm. and, and, and deluded. And, you know, uh, that, that suicide bomber I talked about, he knew he was going to Iraq to fight. He believed if he died he would go to heaven. But he didn't want to be a suicide bomber right away, and he was actually tricked into that mission um, to blow up, which I found was a common experience among many of them. So I think we have to, when we uncover what this world is about, you know, we see a lot more in the way of human complexity. And a lot, strangely enough, while there's some people that are, you know, going to kill us no matter what, I know that. I met them. I sat down across the table from them. The thing is, how much can be achieved um, with those who don't feel that way? How many are misguided? How, mm-hmm. how the change has to come from within their own faith? You know, I, I can't help but uh, think of the movie uh, American History X, you know, which really, right on top of anybody has seen the movie, uh, Edward Norton stars where he is a young white man whose father was killed, and he becomes a white supremacist racist you know, because he was emotionally distraught, so he needed guidance. Right. And and that really hits along with what you're talking about here, that, you know, you take a young man, and, and many of these, as I understand, are recruited as, you know, young teens, even younger than that. That's right. Who are in situations that they're looking for any particular peer group to belong to. I mean, you see that in high schools, for crying out loud. I well, mean, right. just recently, we've got another, you know, Columbine-style shooting that apparently exceeds the Columbine shooting, you know, and it's here in America. So you see, this is really, uh, I guess, you know, when you take a look at your book, you know, Terrorists in Love, it kind of helps people kind of say, okay, you get beyond the evil to say, well, there's a human element. What is that? And is there a possibility to help move away from the violence? Yeah, and, 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 and the answer is a decided yes. I think when people see these stories and read the book, 
And I should tell your listeners, too, there's a website, uh, terraceandlove.com, which has the name of the book, just dot .com. When, when people actually read these stories, you know, I, I, I get such incredible reactions from them uh, that, you know, they, they see the humanity. They're able to reach across. We're able to build a bridge. As I said, not with everyone. I'm not, you know, I'm a right. federal, federal prosecutor. I put away people for my job. So I'm not some, you know, starry-eyed idealist who doesn't, you know, have a... The world is the world and the way that it works. <laughs> right. No, I, you know, I put people away, killers for life. I mean, so mm-hmm. I, you know, I prosecuted child molesters. So I, I understand that there are evil people out there. Right. But I think if we, if we paint everybody with the same brush, we're in danger of, uh, of engaging in an endless war, whereas if we open our hearts and reach across and under, try to understand where these folks are coming from, We'll see a much more complex picture, I think. Now, Ken, in your book, you actually profile and have the uh, first inside look at the Taliban leader, Mullah Omar. Now, when you talk about the younger people that become influenced, that are misguided, that you know are looking for a place to be accepted, and if it causes terrorism and death and evilness, then you know that's fair enough. But people have to lead these people in this direction. Tell us about this character. Yep. Mullah Omar is, a, is an interesting character, and, and this is one thing the book exposes, too, is the corruption and, and, and venality and manipulation and lies of the leaders of al-Qaeda and the Taliban. And that's what turns many of these young men away, because they're idealistic. And I think that's a role for the United States to play, is to expose some of this corruption. But anyway, Mullah Omar is, is, a, is a very interesting character. He is the leader of the Taliban, and we've been fighting against him now for 10 years in Afghanistan, and the book gives the first inside portrait of him and how he works, and it tells the story of his Rasputin, or his seer, who would interpret his dreams to Mullah Omar, and on the basis of dreams, Mullah Omar would decide what to do. For example, when he was, he and the Taliban leadership were, were uh, defeated after 9-11 by the United States, and they fled to Pakistan, um, it, your listeners may recall there was a year or so of peace where the Taliban didn't fight. That was because Mullah Omar was sitting in Pakistan waiting to have a dream from God to tell him to fight. And when Mali, the person portrayed in the book, recounted the dream of Mullah Omar's beard turning white, which took on the cloak of the prophet Muhammad, at that point Mullah Omar said, now I know from God that I must go and fight. So this is the world where, that's why I said earlier, these dreams are very important. To, uh, they, they, they mean prophecy. They don't mean anything else if they're, if they're considered true dreams. So um, this is a different world that we are, we are fighting against. There's no doubt about it. I'm sure many Americans are wondering why terrorism against the United States? What did we do? And I'm talking about the way common Americans who go to their jobs every day pay their bills, hate paying taxes, you know, say, you know, what's up? What's going on here? Well, I, I think, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's not, I know it's, we in the United States, it's hard to appreciate this, and we have been attacked, but the terrorism and the violence is not primarily directed against us. It's actually primarily directed against other Muslims. Um, wow. Um, most victims of terrorism, even since 9-11, are Muslims. In, in their countries. So it, it's a huge problem for those societies, and ultimately that represents the biggest threat to us, that if radicals take over some of these governments, if radicals get control of nuclear weapons, you know, that might, that ultimately presents a greater threat to us than these kind of, you know, more, you know, al-Qaeda types, or if al-Qaeda gets a hold of the nuclear weapons. So there's a real threat out there, but I think sometimes we misperceive it, and it's not, it's not as if they're, you know, for most of them, they're sitting around um, uh, figuring out how to attack the United States. For some, that's true. Um, uh, but for others, it's an internal struggle. Um, that they're now, this may seem just slightly off course here, but at the same time, I think for the listeners, they might say, well, okay, no, it kind of seems on course. And, and that is, there seems to be this perception by Americans about our own government that, that our own government seems to create these threats to justify reasons to go in and to invade countries, for instance, to create war 
for their own special interests. But obviously, because you've been spending more than two decades involved in this particular process of, of, of prosecuting terrorism, of being inside the looks, the hearts, and the minds of terrorists, as you describe and outline in your book, Terrorists in Love, that that's not really true, that there truly really is a threat out there, and there isn't just a perceived one made up to justify the American government going in to take over countries. Yeah, no, there's, there's a real threat. It's very real. There are people who want to kill Americans, and there are people who want to get nuclear weapons so they can destroy us. This is a real threat. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but having said that, we shouldn't, and, and that's part of the point of the book, we shouldn't create more enemies by our actions. Uh, we can narrow down. I think if your listeners read the book, they'll see that some of these people are not our enemies and that by talking to them, and by reaching out to them, we can, uh, we can decrease the numbers of our enemies and focus on the ones that are really our enemies um, and making sure that we defend ourselves against those people, but not overreact or overreach so that we create more enemies. Exactly. As a matter of fact, uh, the one you profile here, there was a suicide bomber who provides us um, uh, survives his attack, and that's Ahmed al Shea. <laughs> Tell us about this guy. Yeah, no, he, he survives his attack. And he was the one who went to Abu Ghraib, and he survives his attack. Um, he, is, he is mutilated. He is badly burned. But he's nursed back to health by an American Army nurse, and she is the first woman he ever met outside his own family, and he becomes fiercely pro-American as a result. Mm -hmm. So he, he, he changed his entire outlook. As he said to me, the uh, al-Qaeda and the Muslim brothers that I went to fight for in Iraq, they treated me like a piece of rotten meat, and the Americans I went to fight against treated me with kindness and respect. It transformed them. It transformed them. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating to realize that as a person like that can turn, as some of these have, that you can begin to see how perhaps there's that possibility that there is a very hopeful end in sight. Well, that's it. I mean, you know, that's absolutely right. And, and uh, I told you the other story of the fellow who had the dream, um, uh, who, who interpreted my dream as seeing the, the prophet, and he, he, he saw my humanity. He saw the enemy as a human being for the first time. I think that was the key. And it transformed him as, as, the, as the fellow who blew himself up and was nursed back by an American army nurse, saw the Americans as human beings, and that transformed him. As I said, not everybody. And there's another story in the book about a, a young Saudi man who's immensely wealthy, and his father is a great religious figure who believes that anyone who's not a true believing Muslim is going to end up in hell. But the son doesn't. The son has changed through his own experiences, which, are, which would take too long to explain, but you can read in the book. Mm -hmm. Here it was a guy who almost went over and gave all his money over to al-Qaeda and then was transformed too. So, uh, you know... These stories of transformation um, uh, give us hope. They give us insight. As I said, not everyone is going to be our friends. There are some people who are implacably, irretrievably our enemies. But it's to those that can change, and it's to us that can change, and it's to our common humanity that this book speaks. Very kind of individual, very intimate stories. Well, and again, when you go back to the attacks of 9-11, you realize that within days and even weeks, it seemed a good uh, portion of Americans were seeking to understand in a very compassionate way. They didn't have this, let's go out and get our payback attitude yep, right off the bat, just like I did this very same day of the attacks. I'm yeah, like, And you have to remember <laughs> one thing. In, in, after 9-11, in December of 2001, there's that famous impromptu taping of Osama bin Laden himself. And he's on this tape laughing about how he had tricked some of the young men to go on a suicide mission and how they never even knew that. So we have to see the manipulation and the lies of these leaders. We have to do a better job of getting the word out, not directly because the United States is not trusted, as a, as, uh, especially our government, but indirectly through um, um, uh, religious clerics in the Muslim world, we can get the word out about the corruption of these people, and that does more to destroy this movement than all the bombs and bullets will ever do. 
And Ken, maybe what you should do also is, uh, as you prosecute some of these people, have some of their community service be involved in serving ice cream at a basket and robins. <laughs> the book is Terrorists in Love, The Real Lives of Islamic Radicals, and our guest today, Mr. Ken Ballin. Ken, go ahead and give out your website again. Yes, it's www.terroristinlove, all one word, dot com, and you can read about the book, and it's available on booksellers or on Amazon or however you want to get it. Okay. Ken, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 Radio Program. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, you bet. Steve. Thank you. Bye. Again, the book is Terrorist in Love, The Real Lives of Islamic Radicals. Our guest today, Mr. Ken Ballin. Be sure to visit us at our website at beyond50radio.com. That's the number 50. Sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter as well. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio Program. And remember, live your day past.